Okay, but we are all here today to talk about rats. Um, so today's presentation, we know we probably have people tuning in from, from all over, but we're going to focus specifically on New York City and urban areas. Um, so we do have rats, in particular the Norway rat, all over the world, which is kind of actually cool. Um, all of the stuff that we're going to focus on today is, as far as mitigation goes, is non-chemical. So there's very much a place for bait traps and exterminators when it comes to rat management, but that's not what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, and I would just like to say from the beginning that gardens, building a garden is not what is attracting rats to your neighbor. The, the likelihood is that they are already there and the garden is just bringing them out because it's not so much the food that they're interested in, it's not what you're growing, it's that your garden provides a really safe place um, for your rats to burrow and nest. And, and, and we'll, so we'll talk about how, you know, we need to think about the whole neighborhood when we think about our garden today. Um, and the last bit is just a tiny disclaimer. We are gonna talk about a lot of things that are gross. Like we're gonna talk about poop, we're gonna talk about urine, we're gonna talk about all kinds of really gross things. So if you are eating, just you have been warned. You have been warned that there's gonna be some gross stuff in this presentation today. Um, let's go to next slide. I'll also mention before we get started, you can put any questions you oh, have yeah. in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen in the toolbar, it says Q&A. So yeah. make sure you put it there and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're gonna talk about Norway rats today. We have, there's many different types of rats, but Norway rats are the ones that you see most often. These are the ones that you find outside. Um, they are what's called commensal rodents, which means that they have adapted to and they depend on the human built environment in order to meet their needs. So they are accessing food, water, and shelter from all of our much needed structures as well. Um, they usually live outside, our friends the Norway rats, but they will come inside if there's food available. And they prefer to burrow in soil or soft earth. So a very popular place that we find burrows throughout New York City is in tree pits. Um, now, when they burrow, they are really cautious and they're very afraid to try new things. So most rats prefer to stay within like 25 to 100 feet of their burrow for food. So when we think about like where we need to look to determine how much rat activity is happening in our neighborhood, we don't have to look very far. It's probably really very contingent on like what's happening block by block. They eat one to two ounces per day. They are kind of constantly eating, plus they're always looking for water. Um, and that's one of the reasons why tree pits are so attractive to them because tree pits are usually not very far from where trash is put out on trash collection days. So they get food and shelter all in one. Um, they are looking for animal protein. They're looking for fat. They're looking for carbs. They're kind of looking for all the tastiest things. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's why when we say that they're attracted to the garden as a burrowing place, but not so much for food, they really need access to fat and carbs, which you know, you're not growing in your garden. Um, and they can fit through holes the size of a quarter so they can collapse their skeletal structure and fit through a hole that's the size of a quarter, which we'll talk about a little bit more when we come to, um, you know, how we need to look for rats in our neighborhood. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, yeah, so here's what we're up against. Um, females, they can reproduce 12 pups per litter. Um, they reproduce four to seven times per year. And so each female rat can potentially create another 36 to 84 rats per year. So rat mitigation, ongoing, really ongoing because one generation cycling out as another one cycles in. Um, their breeding patterns, it used to slow down in winter, but now because we have warmer winters, they're actually able to reproduce year round. And the little tiny babies that they make, um, they mature within two to five months, which means that then they can go out, they can go forth and make more babies. Um, all of those rats live about a year. So again, like they are turning over super quick, which means that we need to be monitoring our gardens at, really at all times, just to make sure that nothing is changing on a daily basis. Um, they are colorblind. They use their whiskers to perceive the world around them. They can climb, they can swim, they can run. They are very nimble. So 
They are very adept at getting into all kinds of spaces. Um, and they mostly operate at night around dusk. So that's when you can see a lot of rat activity in your neighborhood if you're looking for it. And they're just, they are crazy smart. Um, one of the things that I read was that they will, when they create burrows, their burrows have multiple points of entry and exit. And for the ones that they are not using as often, to avoid human de detection, they will put leaves and trash to cover, like they will camouflage their burrow hole. That like blew my mind that they would be intelligent enough to do that. So this is, this is like what we're up against, but there's plenty of stuff that we can do. Um, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Um, so let's talk about some signs of rats. How would you know? And we're going to start with the signs of rats because when we're thinking about building a garden or when we're thinking about like mitigating a garden that maybe already exists, these are the things that we need to look for. Um, gnawing, so chew marks. They chew, they do six bites per second and they are always chewing because their teeth are always growing. So they need to, um, to file down their constantly incoming teeth. They can chew through plastic, wood, lead, aluminum, copper, cinder blocks, uncured concrete. Um, the only thing they have a really hard time chewing time, uh, the only thing they have a really hard time chewing through is steel. So that's something we'll talk about later when we think about materials for the garden. Um, they leave behind, I told you they were smart, something called rub marks, which we'll talk more about, but basically it's like a um, a pheromone path that lets other rats know it's safe to proceed to food sources. They leave runways are another sign. It's like a tiny beaten down path of where rat feet have traveled many, many times. Um, it looks like a, like a hiking trail for humans, but on a very tiny rat scale. Um, burrows, which are their holes, that's where they, they nest down underneath. Um, so we'll look at some pictures of that. They also do tend to leave behind urine and feces, and I'll have some pictures. I warned you that things were gonna be gross. I have some pictures of what the Norway rat um, feces looks like. And then rats, you know, if you see one, you have more. So we'll talk about how to like gauge just how many you have based on the evidence that you've got. Um, next slide. Okay, this is, the, this is what gnawing looks like. Um, so they have, they, these are all the things that they can chew through. If it's, um, let's say that they're chewing through wood, a fresh gnaw mark in wood is gonna be lighter in color. If it's, so that's like one way that you can tell like how active the rats are currently. Whereas like an older gnaw mark is gonna leave like a darker, um, the wood is gonna look a little bit darker because it's been more exposed to the elements for longer. Um, in case you were wondering, like I was, how they could chew through all of these indigestible things and not die from that, um, they have a flap of skin that lowers behind their teeth so that when they're chewing through anything inedible, that skin flap prevents them from swallowing anything that would harm them. So just crazy evolutionary advantage there. Um, and you know, like I said, steel is the one thing that they do have a hard time chewing through. So we'll talk a little bit more about steel later, but let's go to the next slide. Okay, runways. I couldn't find a very good path because these are often very tiny, but it looks like a very tiny beaten down hiking trail for rats. Um, they prefer to travel the same route every day to food and water. So you'll see that runways are mostly on the ground floor level. They love to have a vertical wall like a fence or um, like a foundation wall or an exterior of a building because that to them means, hey, you know, now instead of worrying about things harming me from 360 degrees, I only have to worry about this on three sides because I've got one protective safe wall behind me. Um, they also prefer very long straight lines. So um, they, you know, if you think about like if something is jutting out into the space, it means that there could be a predator or something hiding behind it that's a danger to them. So they like to have a good clear shot. You can um, look like the rub marks that we're gonna talk about next and the runways usually go hand in hand. But one way to test how active, like if you see what you think is a runway and you wanna test to see how active it is, you can sprinkle something like baby powder and then you can see if there are tiny little rat footprints in your baby powder trail. <laughs> Let's go to the uh, next one. Okay, now we're gonna talk about burrows. They love burrowing in earth spaces with fresh soil. 
all of their burrows have one, you know, like a main entrance and a main exit, you'll know if it's an active one, if it's really smooth around the edges because they are constantly going in and out. So it's gonna look compacted and smooth around the outside. Um, they also have those bug out holes. So those are the ones that like, if something's going down in the nest and they, they can't access the entrance or the exit, they can scoot out one of the sides. And those are the ones that they tend to put like debris to throw off humans around. So this gets a little tricky because when we're thinking, like when we're looking for burrows and we're trying to determine what's active and what's not, one thing that might seem like it's not active is that there's trash and leaves covering up a burrow hole, but that could also be them trying to throw us off. So can't go by that. Um, the burrows are always going to be close to a food source, whether that's trash on the street or compost or something else. Um, and they often like to, like tree pits are so popular because they'll maybe start, they'll have one hole, like that they can get through, through the tree pit and then they can burrow underneath concrete, which is not going to be disturbed by people to get some trash piles or something that's out for their food. Um, all of the burrows are one to six feet deep and each burrow can have six to eight rats in there. So if we're trying to get a gauge for like how many rats are happening and we count five burrows, we could times that by eight and know that we probably have about 40 rats lurking around in our space. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's another picture of burrows. This is what they look like in a tree pit. These ones look pretty active because, you know, you can tell that it's compacted. and one of the reasons why garden beds are so popular for rats is because it's like a nice safe spot, right? So they've got four walls protected, lots of nice plant cover, um, nice fresh clean soil that you put there for your plants. <laughs> um, so that's the main reason that they're going to be looking to access your garden is so that they can either like start their burrows or continue like from, you know, another one, connect to another one. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. These are rub marks that those dark spots there on the wall are rub marks. Um, if you've ever seen a cartoon where there's like a trail of breadcrumbs leading to something, um, that's kind of like what a rub mark is. It's a oily secretion, it's a pheromone, sometimes it's urine that they're leaving behind that's guiding the way for other rats. So they are letting you know like, come this way everybody, there's, there's food, there's water, and it's very, very safe. Um, We'll talk about later some ways to break that down with vinegar and water so that the scent is less clear and less attractive for them to follow. But next slide, we have a few more signs of rats. Okay, here's your poop. I promised you there was gonna be some poop in this presentation. I know this picture is a little bit blurry, but bear with me, it's the best one I found. Um, we're looking at Norway rat droppings. So they're, they're longer, they're about three quarters of an inch in length. Um, you know, and they have blunt edges. So like mice tend to have pointier um, and so, same for roof rats. But again, those are not the ones we're talking. We're just talking about Norway. So this is a, a good picture of what that looks like. And we threw in some cockroach poop for fun too, because why not? Uh, let's go to the next slide. <laughs> All right. So in thinking, these are the signs, right? So now that we know the signs, we can think about some of the things that are important to consider in the design of our garden. So if we are just starting from scratch, um, we need to remember that rats are block by block neighborhood issue. So we do need to think about controlling rats as a community effort. Um, in addition to like all of the signs that we looked at above, it's a good idea to check for some holes in the sidewalk as well. That can be an indication that things are burrowing underneath. But if I was starting garden from scratch, these are the things I would look at. I would look at how close is this garden space to the street, right, where trash might be put out for collection on a regular basis, and how close is it to neighborhood restaurants who are going to be putting out more trash than like the average um, apartment building or house or whatever you live near. Um, I would also look at how close is my garden site to the nearest dumpster and to the nearest like trash pickup. And we're gonna talk about dumpsters and trash cans and some ways that we can make sure that they are as inconducive to rat activity as possible. Um, it's a good idea to check if your school or your garden, whatever, wherever you're doing this, is located in what's called a rat mitigation zone. So these are areas of the city where there's already a really high incidence of rat activity and 
we tend to see that Grand Concourse in the Bronx is one, Chinatown, the East Village, Lower East Side is another really hot spot for rats. Um, Bushwick, bed and Brooklyn are also what's considered rat mitigation zones. Um, I will show you a resource later on that you can look up what the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene is doing to treat rats in your neighborhood. Regardless, you can put an address in and it'll show you what's currently happening there. Um, I would think about how close is my garden to a water source. We want water in the garden. We need it for our plants, but we can also mitigate how much access our rats have to that same water source. And then I would look for areas of very dense vegetation or debris that would be good cover for them to hide. I have pictures to show you and any existing evidence. So this is like the mental check like check checklist in design and mitigation. So let's scoot to the next. All right, so if you are located in a rat mitigation zone or you do have rat activity in your neighborhood, that does not mean that you can't have a garden. It means that you just have to plan it a little bit differently. So these are some examples of like ways to grow that are less friendly to rats. So the one on the left is like your, it's a tr pretty traditionally built raised bed, except that we've got a bottom and it's elevated off the ground. Ooh, thank you whoever's doing that with the mouse. That's awesome. Um, so with this, you know, they've only got, I'm going to say that that wood is probably about like 10 to 12 inches deep. That's all they have to burrow in this tiny space. They can't go through your garden bed down underneath and create this like one to six foot structure with multiple entrances and exits. So this is going to feel less safe for them. And we do have some plans that we, we use for um, wheelchair accessible bed building workshop. So that would work for this as well because it's up off the ground. You can make it a little higher even too if you wanted, but this is a good deterrent. And then on the right, these are called woolly pockets. Woolly pockets are fantastic. If you've got a really strong fence, they are little sections of cloth, so lots of good drainage. If you're, you know, they're, they're permeable for rain too, so you won't have to worry about watering as much. And they pack a really good growing punch and potential in there. They're also really nice for privacy. Um, so we're big fans of woolly pockets. A lot of our schools are too, but again, they cannot burrow through this. It's less, they'd have to go up, they'd have to go through, there's a hole to the bottom of this pocket. They can't make their one to six foot structural burrow. It's, it's less attractive. So that's another possible option. And let's go to the next slide. Um, also post, yeah. um, the plans in our follow-up blog post. We will. So can build like that raised um, bed that's elevated off the ground. Yes, yes, definitely. That's all going to be in the follow-up that you will get later tonight. Um, these are another two, these are two more options. So on the left we have steel, like the, I guess horse troughs is what they are. Like you fill this with water, animals could come drink for it, but if you put a couple of holes for drainage in the bottom, you now have a less permeable container for rats to chew through. They could potentially still burrow inside here. So it's not foolproof, but it's a little bit, it's, it's just, we just wanna make things that much harder for them, right? So it's harder for them to chew through this, eh, I'll go down the block, right? Um, so that's one, they are, these are costly though. So that's something to think about, but a lot of our schools in Brooklyn use these, they absolutely love them. So um, one option to consider. And then on the right, this is a more traditional looking raised bed, right? Like it's on the ground. We'll show you some things that you can do to the bottom of this bed to make it a little harder for them to burrow through. But the real star here is the cold frame cover up the top. So we've re this person has repurposed some old windows. Cold frames are awesome for season extension because when you close them, they are gonna hold heat like a greenhouse, except that you it's just holding sunlight. It's not holding any kind of like other heat source in there. So you get to extend your growing season and cut off an exit entry point for rats. So these are also super cool. This is just one way to do them. Again, we're gonna share some plans for cold frame covers with you in the follow-up. Let's do next slide. Okay, and now this is some stuff that we can talk about. Again, it is not entirely, entirely foolproof, but um, when we think about the bottom of a bed, a raised bed, if you wanted to put it straight onto the ground, or you wanted to use this, like we're gonna talk about garden sheds a little bit later too, and we're gonna talk about um, uh, compost systems as well. So these are a few materials that can help you. All the way on the left, this is called hardware mesh. It's a 
metallic, uh, like a steel screen, right? And if I was, I would build my raised bed the regular way, and then I would cut this to fit the bottom. So I would lay this all the way across the bottom of the bed so that it makes it harder for them to burrow through. And I would also like fold it up like two to three inches across the side of the bed so that they can't just like ooh, look a hole and go up around the side of it. And then on top of the hardware mesh, you can also put gravel, right? So now they'd have to get through some mesh. They'd have to get through um, like two to three inches of gravel under there as well. It's like, again, forget it. I'll just go down the block to where there's things that are a little bit more readily available. Um, and if you, you know, let's say you're, you're going around and you're noticing that there's some holes to like exteriors of buildings, or you're looking at your garden shed and there's some holes there. Um, the thing all the way on the right is called excluder fabric. So think about that, that's like steel wool. Sometimes we take steel wool and we pop that in holes. You can use steel wool, but this is like a upteenth time more abrasive than steel wool is. So it's just that much more aggravating for them to, to chew through. Um, it's really aggravating to them. That means it's also really aggravating to us. So if you are gonna use excluder fabric, you wanna use scissors, you wanna use gloves, you wanna use some protective eyewear so that those little fibers don't aggravate you. We want it to aggravate the rats, but not us, right? Um, so these are a couple of things that you can use to exclude them from, whether it's dumpsters, trash cans, underneath your compost pile, underneath your shed, and in your raised beds as well. Let's do next slide. Okay, um, some other things that you can do for prevention. Trash, um, according to the, the Department of Sanitation, cleanliness is key. Like securing our trash takes away their whole food source. We, it makes it really hard for them. I'll give you some examples of how we can do that. Um, avoiding dense planting. So people ask a lot about if there are plants that can deter rats. Not really, but there are plants and plantings that will attract them. So we want to make sure that we are not you know, making that easy for them there. Clutter, lots of places to hide is great for them. Um, stagnant water, which is also, you know, problem for mosquitoes. So we'll talk about some ways to, to reduce that down. And then collapsing the burrows. Um, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene did a rat academy with us uh, last fall. And they said one of the other, so sanitation, yes, but then Another single most important thing you can do is collapse those burrows. So we'll talk about how and when to do that too. So let's do next slide. Okay, dense plantings. Ivy is a huge attractant to rats because they can burrow under that. They can scurry beneath it and we won't see them. So any kind of like really super dense ground cover is something that we might want to think about removing or think about how close we are located to that when we build our garden. If you can pull it out, pull it out, you put something else in there that kind of gives you the same low maintenance thing but isn't attracting them. Um, and now in the next slide we're going to talk about dense plantings within our beds. So if I look at the, the raised bed on the left, they've got a lot of thick plants in there. There's a lot of stuff up against the side of that house. It's hard for me to, to look at that and like easily see, ooh, a new burrow, right? Because I'd have to get through all this dense planting in order to see it. Whereas like the garden beds on the um, right, I can see there's space between those plants. Like if something happens in there, it's gonna be a little bit more obvious. So not over planting our, our beds is key. It's also really important just in controlling other kinds of pests and like making sure that we're not um, facilitating Chantel just did a really awesome workshop on natural pest management and talked about a whole host of other pests that like love dense plantings too. So just, just avoid the dense planting. That's a really easy one. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, clutter. I know it happens. It does, right? Um, so here's some clutter outside. So again, if, there, if there's rat activity, this is going to conceal it for us. So we can neaten this up and make it easier for us to perceive what they're doing in our space. Same for the shed. You know, sheds are, again, like a good source of shelter. We often store things like seeds in sheds. And so um, the denser it is, the less we can see what's happening in there, and we will not know. Debris piles like this, I know they build up really quick, especially if you've got some kind of a storm and you've raked up, you're like, I'll do it later. Or if you have a, like a, 
um, a, a not so organized compost pile. But again, this is going to attract rats and it's going to attract other unwanted pests in the garden as well. So all of this could be done away with. Um, let's do the next slide. Okay, now we're going to talk about water. So um, we need water in the garden, right? But we can do a better job of making sure that our water goes where we want it to go. So if I'm looking at this picture here, here's a leaky hose attachment that's just spraying water all over the place. And if we have an uneven surface that can kind of flow downwards and it can pool in places that we don't want it to go or that are harder to reach. Um, so checking for things like proper hose connection, we can make it a point just like you go into the garden to water every day, tipping out planters where water is accumulating, empty pots, tools, like trying to mitigate that as much as possible is really important. Um, especially like we're going into mosquito season. So this will help you with mosquito management as well. Um, and, you know, if we're, if we're, if our water's going where we want it to go, then we're not overwatering our plants and we're also not wasting water, which we have to remember is a vital resource that we need to conserve. Um, you know, sometimes too, we need to check for places where um, water could be accumulating that are not our garden. So like we had a school that was out in Queens, their garden was neat, but they were having some issues with, um, with mosquitoes, right? And they had on the other side of their garden was a vacant lot where there was trash accumulating and mosquitoes only need a cap full of water to breed and to live. So in like crumpled bags of chips or bottle caps, you've got mosquitoes and same for here, then that's going to draw rats. So, you know, they didn't make the problem on the other side of the fence, but as soon as they went in there and helped to clean it up, it alleviated a lot of the issues that they were having with pests. So next slide. All right, trash. I've got a lot of things to say about trash today. Um, <laughs> so number one, trash cans and dumpsters need to be tightly covered and we can't let them overflow. Now I know this is like, it may not be you, it may be somebody else in the neighborhood. And that's when I say that this is a community issue. This is one of the things that we're talking about is how we dispose of trash. Um, we also need to make sure that they are tightly covered and that they do not have drainage holes. All that icky water that flows out of the bottom of a, of a garbage can or a dumpster is like a beacon, right, to rats. So like, this is fantastic. I've got sludgy water and I've got food. Um, we want to store these containers properly right until before trash pickup so that it's, it's gone as soon as it's out. Um, any kind of drainage hole in a dumpster, that's where we can use that um, landscape fabric or that excluder mesh to plug those holes so that they can't be going in and out. Um, and as much as possible, if we can put our trash collection systems on top of cement, that makes it a lot easier to hose it down and dilute that nice trash smell that's going to bring them out. Um, a vinegar mix, like a one-to-one -one vinegar mix is good. Like if you can smell the vinegar and it's like slightly offensive to you, perfect, right? Um, it's their, their sense of smell is a lot stronger than ours, so that's great. And that'll help to like reduce the residue that's going to draw them. You can also use the same vinegar one-to-one -one mix to scrub away the rub marks that they have left on the side of the building so that they, they, are, they don't have that path leading each other to more food and water. Let's go to the next slide. Um, compost bins. You should absolutely have a compost bin in your garden. It's awesome for your garden and it's awesome for our planet. Um, but when we're thinking about rats, there's a few things that we don't want to do with our compost system. Number one, we know that they need fat and they need carbs. So it's totally fine to put your food scraps that are not cooked right into those piles. But if we're putting grains and we're putting meat and we're putting fats and oils, that is like a buffet for them, right? Because now they can nest in your beds and they can eat from your compost <laughs> system. So none of that, no grains, no meat, no fats, no oils. Um, we also want to use tight fitting thin. Our friends at the Department of Health, they recommend for gardens that you use a, um, an enclosed tumbler. And one of the round tumblers is great because it's harder for rats to sink their teeth into a curved edge versus like a, a, a sharp, um, hard edge for them. So like tumblers, great. And you could, it's also fun to use a tumbler if you've never used one. It's like a great workout. Um, 
if you're not going to do this and you want to have like the more traditional way, then you could make a bed. You could pour some concrete underneath, right, before you build your three din system or whatever you're going to use. And that will help to deter them from burrowing through. Or you can put the gravel, like the, the three quarter inch gravel underneath to help deter them from burrowing through. Let's go to the next slide. Um, next is, is sheds, right? So same thing, we probably wanna build a base for that shed. Concrete slab or pebbles is great. Um, we wanna keep it neat so that we're not accumulating a lot of clutter. We want to seal whatever holes, so the excluder fabric or the landscape, the hardware cloth could be good for that. Um, if we're storing seeds in our shed, then steel containers are best. Not that the seed is gonna be the thing that they really want. They want those fats and those oils, but like they will eat whatever is available if that's all there is. So let's just make it harder for them. Um, and we need to inspect it often so that we know if things are going in and out. We can do the next slide. All right, collapsing burrows. So our friends of the Department of Health and hygiene have said that one of the biggest things that we can do is collapse these burrows. Um, we want to make this hard for them. So if you're going to collapse the burrow, use a stick. Do not use your hands. Never, ever, ever stick your hand, gloved or not, into the burrow because you have to figure there's like six to eight rats down there cozying up. And like if they get scared, that's your hand. So don't do it. Use a stick. Um, if you so you could make this like it's suggested that you do it same as you do like you make a watering schedule for everybody in the garden so then nightly as part of the like gar garden care maintenance we take that stick and we collapse the burrows some people like to put gravel into the burrows as well you know you just just want to make it really inhospitable um if you do find that there are burrows in your beds um we usually, I know this is very unpopular, but we recommend that you start over with the beds, that you get rid of that soil. You start, you, you, you might even want to get rid of the lumber as well that you used to build the bed, or if it's like a container, you want to wash it out very thoroughly because they are living in those holes. They're making nests. They're bringing trash to pad their nests. They're bringing food down there. They're excreting in there. They have had babies in those nests. Like, not necessarily something that you want to be like growing edible food and harvesting from to eat. So um, they, they do, rats do carry diseases. The Department of Health has a list of the diseases that rats carry. And one very positive thing is that it is pretty rare that those diseases are reported here in New York City. So, you know, just for the, for the ick factor, just start over with new soil and new beds, and then you have a chance to like redesign the space, knowing that you you've had the this issue in the garden. So stupid. I've slide. also heard oh. if you um, if you don't if you can't get new lumber when you're after you've disassembled and are rebuilding, you could just try to disinfect the lumber. With, using yeah, vinegar or bleach or something. Yeah, it's up to you. I mean, you do have to inspect it to make sure that they don't have those rub marks and that there's not like a whole lot of activity on the boards. Um, so you might even want to treat it with something that makes it a little easier to see, like a linseed oil or something, but, you know, personal preference, I, I'd probably start over. So <laughs> let's go to the next one. All right. This is my list of things that do not work or that there's not enough scientific evidence to support that it works. People, so we have a lot of community gardeners that swear by cedar oil, but according to Department of Health, there just isn't enough scientific evidence to really support the fact that cedar oil works. So feel free to try it, but just know that it's not like a surefire thing. Cats, um, we talked before about the rate in which rats breed. Uh, cats can't physically keep up. And not only that, but if you are putting food out to attract cats, you are attracting rats. Um, you know, you, we've all seen the signs. If you feed a whatever, you breed a rat, right? So it's same goes for, for, for cats. Um, deterrent plants, you know, like we said, there's some people swear by like catnip and mint and, you know, feel free to plant it for other reasons, but it's with any pest management, it really isn't the plant itself. It's the oils that they release. So it takes a lot of, like Chantel talked about this, at natural pest management, it takes a lot of the massaging of the plants to release the oils in the first place. So it more air towards 
not planting the stuff that's going to attract them versus trying to plant something to deter them. Rat proof trash bags. Um, you know, some people think they work, like a, some of our community gardeners have used them and they swear by it, but you know, there's not, others have said it hasn't worked for them at all. So I think a lot of this depends on like the severity of the, the rat activity in your, your neighborhood. Um, let's do the next slide. Okay, um, we talked about community action. So these are some of the things that you can do with your neighbors to ensure that you're not creating a conducive environment for rats. Number one is don't feed wildlife. If you feed a pigeon, if you feed a cat, you feed a rat. I told you there was gross stuff. Um, we need to curb our dogs, right? Because dog waste has a lot of nutrient in it that rats are more than happy to eat. So great, good for them, but pick up after the dogs. <laughs> Um, we can check the sidewalks for crack, cracks, we can check the tree pits for burrows. Um, sanitation, according to Department of Health, is the most important thing that you can do aside from collapsing those burrows. So making sure that dumpsters and trash cans in the neighborhoods are using tight-fitting lids and that they're not draining out all over the sidewalk. Um, any rat activity that is happening in your neighborhood, you can report to 311. Um, they will follow up with the Department of Health. Very, they are still, even despite COVID, they have still been going out and doing inspections, which is cool. Um, they're also, you know, you can go to this nyc.gov slash rats website, and that's where you can type in your exact address and see what's already been happening. So it'll tell you like inspections, these following dates, like here's what we did. Um, they are gonna, they are going to send exterminators. So that's where you're going to get into bait traps and pesticides. And so as much as possible that we can avoid that, we want to. But like at the same time, I would say if you're having a bunch of problems in the neighborhood, don't let it, you know, call them before it escalates to the point that it's even harder to fix. Um, you can also host a rat academy in your neighborhood. So through the same website, you can have them come out to your neighborhood for all of your neighbors and do well, maybe now everything's virtual, but they will come and they will talk to your specific neighborhood so you can ask them concerns about your block. Um, they'll also send you pamphlets and posters. They have, they'll send it to you in bulk and they have it available in multiple languages so that you can circulate out to like apartment buildings or different businesses that are operating that may be contributing. And you can always email them at ratportal at health.myc.gov. They're actually really responsive. So um, those are some things that you can you can do and let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so now that's kind of it. We have reached the end. I'm sure we have lots and lots of questions. Um, so we're gonna be, just a reminder that we are gonna be answering these questions in the Q&A. So if you've got questions and you want us to try to answer them, make sure that they're in the Q&A. Great, cool. So we do have some questions to start cool. off with. Um, do the legs on the raised bed example really help? So like the elevated raised bed, if I have bricks I could put under, would that have the same effect? Yeah, I don't think the, the wood matters. Um, if you wanted to prop it up on something else, I think that's totally fine. Um, yeah, we use, I think probably a lot of our gardeners use wood just because they've got it around and it's like reasonably inexpensive to pick up versus like a cinder block or something. but. Yeah, feel free to get creative with that and pick it up. Yeah, and um, if you are gonna be building an elevated bed off the ground, you'll have to get a piece of plywood to put yeah. on the base of it with like drainage holes in that. Um, yes. So that's why you still might wanna take a look at our, our building plans because it says how to bore the holes into that piece of plywood and put like funnels in there to make sure that your the bottom of the plywood isn't just rotting away super fast. Right. Yep. And, one but other thing is that rats do climb really do. well. So no <laughs> matter how high up you put your bed, they're still going to be able to climb up into it, but they'll be less likely to because they won't be able to make like exactly their little home that they like to make their burrows more than a foot deep. So it's exactly. a deterrent. Yeah. All right. Next question is we have a couple questions about rat traps, and there's someone asked specifically about a black rat trap, which I'm not familiar with the different models of rat traps. Yeah. But people um, are asking, do they work? Do you recommend them? 
I mean, sure, right? Like, I, you know, I think that's a that's a great question for um, the rat the rat portal folks because they've got some. They can give you a whole lot of like anecdotal information about what they've set all around the city and what's worked and what hasn't. Um, yeah, we we tried to like focus today is more on the design and like the mitigation of versus like trapping. So I would I would reach out to the rat portal folks to see if they have like a strong opinion on what works best there. Yeah, my my feeling is that you're not gonna be able to trap the rats at a rate that will make yeah. so much of a difference. So that's why it's better to focus more on the design. Um, and then you'll also need to have someone who's okay with disposing of decapitated rats or like getting rid of them if they're in cages. So it turns into more of a chore that may not be worth all that effort. Yeah, and I would, you know, they are smart, right? So like there were some studies done where they, like with poison, where eventually they could like smell it from far away and just would avoid the chances entirely. So I would reach out to the rat portal people just to see what's been like trending and what before you invest in traps um, to see. Yeah, and the other thing that um, people will do in the rat mitigation zones is they, if it's really an infestation that cannot be controlled, they'll have to have a professional yeah. um, like exterminator come in and put like chemical bait traps for rats, which those ones are effective. They're just extremely toxic. So right. last case scenario and can only be done by professionals. Should, kids should not be anywhere near it or things like that. Or animals, other animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, another question. Are there any edible plants that rats like that could be attracting them? Um, one example is, do they like cucumbers <laughs> or anything in particular? So, you know, the thing, they're not really all that picky about what they eat. Like their first choice is always going to be animal fats, oils, grease, protein, you know, most of which we're not, we're not growing that. And they got great, oh, they love grains because that's a great carb. Um, but I don't think there's any like, I think they'll, they'll, they'll like experiment with the vegetables if that's what's a bit, like if it's a bad trash day, they might be more inclined to like hop over and see what's going on in your garden. But I don't think there's anything that they like really particularly want to eat in there. Like if they have that access to the other stuff, that's what they're going to go for first. And the rest is just like secondary. Mm -hmm. um, so someone has seen a planter that has heart, like the hardware mesh or the hardware cloth on top of the planter. Yeah. And there's a little hole cut out for the plant to actually um, <laughs> grow out of. Uh, yeah. So is that better or worse than having it underneath? the bed soil um and yeah you know that's a good question and i think that if you have it on the top of the bed then they can't get in from the top but they can potentially get in from the bottom now i would be curious there like if that planter was actually on concrete or something versus they like on the planter has a bottom so I'm not sure if that means like a wooden bottom or something. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I think that maybe, look, and you know what? I will say this, like people get desperate with their gardens. They're like, I have tried this, 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 and it's not working. So I could see how someone would be like, let's just put the hardware mesh on top and see how it goes. I would say that if they could burrow through from the bottom, that it's probably better to start with the mesh at the bottom. And then if you're still having problems and you want to try putting something over the top, then like, then go for it. But if they can burrow through, if a rat could potentially come in, because we know that they can fit through something that's the size of a quarter, right, or smaller. So if they could potentially come through where the opening of that plant is and just scoot right down to underneath, I'm not sure that that's going to be all that helpful. Oh, the one thing that I forgot to mention before that I should mention now is that um, that Hardware fabric has like very teeny tiny openings, right? Some people ask us if like chicken wire will work because chicken wire is probably more cost effective than the um, hardware fabric, but it will not work because those are those holes are too big and it's too uh, like essentially like flimsy of a material. So they'll be able to chew through that with a couple of bites and fit straight through it. <laughs> so go for the, the hardware fabric. Yeah, and I've also heard um... Yeah, you want to make sure that the holes are smaller than a quarter in your hardware yep. fabric 
but you don't want it to be too small holes right. either because that means that the actual wire is not as thick. And yeah. so it'll be again, easier for them to chew through. So you want to do something around, I think I've heard three quarter inch. Yes. Yeah. Holes in your hardware cloth. All right. Um, we have hedges for privacy and I believe the rats are burrowing below the hedges. Um, we don't want to get rid of them, but they, they might be using that as a pathway and to hide their burrows. Would removing any possible food sources, like a bird feeder, help eliminate the rats, um, or should, do we have to get rid of the hedges? I, I, if you want to keep the hedges, I would try to, I would try a few other things before taking them out. Um, one, if you can look under there to see if they're burrowing and if you can collapse those burrows or if you can throw some um, gravel into those, I would start there. And yes, like if you can, if you can shore up the food sources, they don't want to travel. They don't want to go more than 25, from 25 to 100 feet from their home burrow. So I would look within that radius to see what's happening. Is it trash? Is it, um, is it the bird feeder? Is water collecting in the bird feeder? Like is something happening over there that's making it more attractive? So I would do the burrow collapsing or filling up with um, gravel first and removing those food sources. And then if that still wasn't working, then maybe I would, you know, I would either reassess or I would think about the hedges. Yeah, and the burrow collapsing, uh, keep, you might have to have, keep doing that for a couple of weeks or so. Um, it's kind of yeah. like it takes a little bit of dedication, but it we have been told that's the most effective thing. So just getting out there every day at dusk, because that'll mess with their the time when they're the most active and they want to be out. Um, so that'll just aggravate them the most. Think, oh, for sure. Like think about it. If like if somebody opened up my front door every day and threw trash in here, like I'd probably like clean it up the first few times, and then eventually I'd like want to move, right? Because it would get like it would be ridiculous if somebody kept doing this. <laughs> so so they, that's where, you know, that, that burrow is where they're nesting. It's where they're having their babies. Like they need to be able to go down there and sleep. They need to rest. If you are making it really hard for them, that's very undesirable. So. Yeah. Uh, someone made a good point about the traps as well, because people were asking questions about that, that sometimes the traps can actually attract more rats because they are baited with like food that the rats like. That's so a you good might point. kill one or two rats that actually get caught in the trap, but you might actually be attracting even more than that. Yeah. You know, getting trapped. So that's a good that's point. That's an excellent point. Yeah. So someone, um, a school gardener, do you have any suggestions about what to do with school cafeteria trash to minimize attracting rats to a nearby school garden? Some yeah. schools leave a large pile of trash bags on the sidewalk. I know this is a big problem for many of our schools. It's huge. Um, so the trash collection is one thing because it's going to go out at night and they're going to hopefully, you know, come the next day and scoop that up. I think investigating the dumpster and how the dumpster is being maintained is important. Like if the dumpster is overflowing, it can't be sealed. Um, if the dumpster has the drainage coming out from under it, that, you know, that scent carries on the wind and they're going to come forth for that. Um, so doing what you can to shore up the dumpster would be great. That's also something like when we do our like site assessments with schools or when schools come to us and they're like, hey, we're thinking about starting a garden, we try to factor in how close. And so if, if you are really close to that dumpster, it's a good conversation to have with the custodian. And it's a good time to put some of these like garden design practices into place so that, you know, look, we are gonna have rats, we are gonna have them. We live in New York City, they are smart. They have managed to make their way to every single country almost in the entire world. They are adapting and changing constantly, right? So we're gonna have them. It's not the question of like, you know, not keeping the garden completely pristine. It isn't gonna happen. It's more about just making this like unlivable for them. Mm -hmm. so then they go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. And I know the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the, the whole rat team with them, they have been piloting some programs yeah. of different models of dumpsters, dumpsters. specifically for like school, you know, for schools. Um, and they would be, you know, more resistant to rats and they like seal really well. So hopefully in the, in the next couple of years, it, it depends, but I know they're definitely working on ways to better store the trash. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a tough question. 
Um, all right, we have a couple more minutes and we have a couple more questions. So uh, I have an open bin compost. Do you recommend putting a cover on it or a net? Um, they've seen a couple of rats lurking near the bin and our cat doesn't seem to mind them. <laughs> um, yeah, and that cat labor. They do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if you have, well, I would be curious to know if your bin was located, like what, what's on, what your bin is on top of. Like, do you have a slab under it? Or again, is it open to the ground? If it's open to the ground, I'm not sure that the, if the whole thing's completely enclosed, like if you've built it out of wood, then it might be worth like stuffing any of the cracks with the excluder fabric and throwing a, a lid over the top. Um, if it's like a chicken wire situation that's sort of separating, keeping the stuff contained, I don't know if the cover would help you then because they'd be able to get through that just fine. Um, so if you want to shoot us, we've got our, our emails that we're going to share at the end of this. If you want to shoot us a picture of your bin system, then maybe we could better answer that question a little bit. Yeah, I would say Annette probably that wouldn't get in their way at all. Um, but I know I've seen some compost uh, situations where it's in like a steel bin. Right. And then you can poke the holes and plug that with excluder mesh. And so there are ways to go about a compost um, situation that's a bit more resistant. Yeah, just email us a picture of it and yeah. we, can, <laughs> we can answer that for you. Okay, um, so this is a last question. I heard rats don't like gravel and won't burrow in it. I put some down in my bed area, but I did notice a new burrow within a couple weeks. Okay, yeah. yeah. On that. Yeah, so they so they don't. Um, the gravel size does matter a little bit too. Like something that's super tiny, like I'm thinking, um, like a like what the, the kind of gravel you would put in a fish tank is probably not going to be all that effective because it's so small and light. But a quarter inch to three quarter inch gravel is going to be heavier and it's going to be a lot more of an effort for them to plow through. Um, also, you know, they are constantly breeding and like new rats are constantly coming on the horizon. So you may have actually deterred some and then a new generation game is like, I'm gonna give it a try. Um, so that's where it's like this constant ongoing. Uh, there's, there's something else. Do you guys remember what it was called? Something with an S. Uh, sal mm. Salad or... So it's daylight. Daylight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's what it's called. Yeah, there's this, uh, it's like kind of like a steel, not a steel, like a, 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 a really heavy dust that, of like stone dust that's been used to fill in some burrows as well. Um, and I think they've had some, that's another thing that's been like reasonably successful with preventing some burrows. Yeah. All right. So um, we're just at about 3 p.m. So we're going to log off for the day. There were, we got all the rat questions answered, which is awesome. There were a couple of questions just about more general pest management, like with bugs and things like that. So for that, I'd recommend you all check out GrowNYC, distancelearning.org. We did another session just on natural pest management with Chantel, and she gave us a ton of good and useful information. So we are going to send you a follow-up email later this afternoon, and that will link you to our blog post on GrowNYC, distancelearning.org that will um, take you to all the resources and the recording of this session. Um, in addition to that, make sure you look at our upcoming workshops in two weeks from now. Chantel will be doing herbal care and remedies. Two weeks after that, I'll be doing um, container gardening for both indoor and outdoor. And uh, we'll see you for the upcoming sessions. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.